Hi, everybody. Oh, James is here. He has decided to sh grant us with his presence today. Now, now. Thank you, madam. I'm, I'm a little bit tired today, so I'm not prepared for your uh, sarcasm there, Beth. You're going to have to ask you to yeah, sarcasm. Bring, I have... down, bring that down a notch or two. Oh. I don't do sarcasm. I've never done sarcasm in my whole life. She says sarcastically. Now, we were talking and we didn't know if you were going to be able to join us due to your travels. So no, I got back last night uh, and I'm slowly uh, working way through uh, all the emails and everything that happens while uh, you're away at a conference, which I'm sure this group knows well. So I'm certainly not going to get any sympathy here, but that's fine. I'm not here for your sympathy. I'm here for your knowledge. Um, so it looks like we got a good group. I see some familiar faces. I see some new faces, which is always great. Um, so just, I will very quickly introduce myself. My name is James Bauman. I'm the publications director for AKUOI, uh, which I always like to say, if it has words or pictures, I'm probably involved in one way or another. Uh, I also have the privilege and honor of serving as the staff liaison for the Small College and University Network. So that means I get to uh, be a part of these calls. I get to work to help develop um, the Small College and University Symposium, uh, which I will mention here in a little bit, um, and anything else related to it. Um, as a graduate, at least from an undergraduate point of view of a small college, um, I have a, always had a soft spot. So it's great to hear uh, what's happening on your campuses and what's going on. Um, I will take this moment to do a sh totally shameless plug if you have not registered, there is still plenty of time to join the Small College and University uh, Housing Symposium happening next Wednesday from noon until 5 Eastern time. We have some fantastic speakers lined up that are ranging from uh, Dr. Jason Lynch, who is going to be speaking about staff well-being and has been doing a good deal of uh, research in this area, and um, I was talking to him a couple of weeks ago, and he has just recently been doing some work specifically focused on smaller schools. So we're really looking forward to hear from his research and his experience and taking your questions. And then we also have panelists of professionals like yourself that will be speaking on communication strategies, hiring and retention issues. Some of you may be dealing with that on your campus. I don't know. Um, and of course, also talking about um, some of the unique challenges that come with implementing DEI initiatives on a smaller campus. So again, I think these are very uh, important topics. Um, they were called from hearing suggestions, again, from this group and from others. And uh, I'm really happy with the uh, slate of speakers and presenters we have that are going to be a part of it. So um, it's also priced very affordably. I. Off the top of my head, I think it's $30 for an individual or for $100, you can do a team pass, in which case you can invite your entire staff. And I've heard from a few people that have reached out to me saying, do they have to be housing staff? And I was like, no, they do not. If you wanna bring in other people from uh, student affairs professionals uh, to help understand what's happening in the world of campus housing on smaller college campuses, please do so. Um, so with that being said, I will now turn it over to Beth, who can uh, spout a little bit more about the symposium and get to the business of the day, which is hearing from all of you about what challenges you're facing and sharing educational resources with each other. Take it away, Beth. I'm not allowed to be snarky though, right? No, I'm just joking. But not, but not in a snarky way, do it earnestly. I don't know what that means. No, I'm just joking. Um, hi everybody. I am nice and warm. I don't know if it's warm where you are, but I don't know what Central New York decided to do. We were like in the 30s with snow a week ago, and now it's 80 degrees today. So welcome to Central New York. I'm not complaining. The only thing is the mosquitoes are already out. Like what the, what the, moving on. Um, so I am Beth. I am the director of housing at SUNY Morrisville, which is in Central New York. Um, what I would love to do, since we do have some new faces and some amazing returners, if we could all go around and say who we are, where we're from, um, really quick, I will start with Deb, since she's my first person on my screen. And then Deb, if you can say the next person, we'll just do it that way. 
Yep, I'm Debbie Kolstad and I'm the Director of Residence Life at Lewis Clark State College and I'm in Lewiston, Idaho. And then Lewis, it's to you. Luis? Okay. Hey y'all. Um, Luis, Luis um, Jimenez, you know, Associate Dean of the College for Student Living and Wellness at Vassar College, uh, small liberal arts college in Poughkeepsie, New York. Um, I will pass it to Patrick. Hey everybody, uh, Patrick Benner, University of Richmond, Richmond, Virginia. I will popcorn to Amy. Hi, I'm Amy Sign. I'm the Director of Residence Life at Washington College in Maryland, and we'll pass it to my buddy, Ken. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ken Lestoka. I'm the Director of Housing and Residence Life at Cedar Crest College in Allentown, Pennsylvania, a small uh, women's college here in the Lehigh Valley. And I will throw it over to Duan. Good afternoon. My name is Dewan Worsley, Director of Residence Life at Hood College, located in Frederick, Maryland. Heather. Thanks. Uh, Heather, she, her pronouns. I serve as the Director of Residence Life Housing and Student Conduct at Willamette University, which is in Oregon. I think Becky. Is there a Becky? Hi. Yes. Hi, thank you. Yes, I'm Becky Falto, the Director of Residence Life and Housing at Vaughn College in New York. And I'm in transit right now, so sorry I'm off camera, but uh, who did not go? Did Penny go? Otherwise, I turn it over to Penny. I think we have Penny and Kelly left. Does that sound right? Or everybody else? Yeah, go? I think Penny. I can introduce myself. Oh, uh, hi. So, hi, I'm Maureen Islip from uh, I'm the Director of Residential Life at Wesleyan University, located in Middletown, Connecticut. Awesome. Callie and Penny, do either of you want to go? Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Callie O'Reilly. I'm the Assistant Director of Residence Life at Goldie Beacom College in Wilmington, Delaware. We do have Meredith, who is on our back end, doing all the wonderful tech stuff for a crew ride. So, just wait. Um, oh, hi. hi, everyone. Um, excuse me, like Beth said, my name is Meredith. Uh, I'm an educational program coordinator for a coup Hawaii. And so I'm often floating in the background of some of these calls, making sure folks are registered and can get in and all those things. Um, and I'll also just plug that, you know, I'm pretty fond of this group myself. I My background is working at small colleges in Ohio. So good group to sit in the background of. And we appreciate it. Um, so I do have some questions that were asked if we want to knock those out right away and then go from there. Does that work for everybody? And if you are not registered for the Small College University Symposium, please get registered. It's going to be amazing. And some of you, we are going to have you on roundtables. So thank you for everybody that we have shoulder tapped and reached out to. Um, and yes, you can definitely have other departments. Um, our EOP office is coming. Our conduct office is coming. Um, one of our student activities members wants to come just to see what's going on in the housing world. So you know how at small colleges and universities, we all wear small hats. Just invite your common, I guess, colleagues and see if they're interested, especially if you pay for the, whatever, the campus ticket or whatever it's called. Okay. So the first question was support staff through being urged out. So, um, oh, I think I understand that. So does anybody know different ways of supporting staff? Like right now I have staff that is in the process of, it's only a four year RD position. And so we're helping them get their resumes built up, stuff like that to help them with their next step. Um, what other things do people do when either someone's looking to move on or they're hitting their timeline? Sorry, my phone's going off and going to silent it. This, um, I like that this summer, um, after actually um, engaging in a conversation with, with um, I'm blanking out on Delby's last name, um, we're, we're asking all of our um, entry level folks, independent of where they're at kind of year wise to engage and, and ideally two to three informational interviews with folks who are holding positions that they'd like to have over the course of, so like 
you know, we don't have traditional summer here, no summer classes, and so it's a much slower. And so we're hoping that they, they take some time at least to start to um, imagine a life away from here <laughs> um, and work away from here as well. And like, we thought it'd be helpful to, to talk with folks who are doing the work that they, they may be most interested in doing after these roles. I, I could try to find the kind of questions that Delmi has like this incredible list of questions for an informational interview that she shared with us and um, in a higher ed class uh, that I was a part of it in, in, at Syracuse. I can let's see if I can find that resource and, and share with folks. Anything else? Anybody else wants to share? Does anybody else copy and paste higher higher ed jobs and send it to them? Because I do that almost every morning. Um, I actually go in and add where people want to live so that that way I can be like, oh, they want to go to Kentucky. Oh, they want to go to the West Coast. I have one RD that just wants to go live in a big city. So I have all the cities like on it. Um, <laughs> I was just going to joke to say, but not joke. If you have anyone that wants to move to Oregon, I'm hiring. So anyway. I do. I have someone. Well, where in Oregon? Are you near a city? I'm, we're in Salem, Oregon, which is the capital. So it's right in between Portland and Eugene, like an hour each way. Can you Uber eat? You can talk your offline. <laughs> what was that? That's one of the yeah. requirements is Uber eating. Um, Uber orders, because we can't do that here. So that's one of the requirements that one of my future RDs has. Um, it's very entertaining. I crack up like some, I'll sit with them during their one-on-ones and be like, so if you had a dream job, what are some things you would like? And this person literally said to be able to order Uber Eats. I'm like, what? And they were, they were dead serious. I was like, okay, that's a valid thing. You can't do that here. Cool. Um, one other person said that they could just get an Uber. They would like to just have an Uber. Um, so yeah, those were things. That's very entertaining. Um, the next question is how do you better serve your student development needs? And I have a student on my doorstep to shop my camera, but feel free to talk to them. Did she put the question in? What was the question? I might have missed it. The application, the question was, how can we better serve our student development needs? I will copy and paste it into the chat. I'm sorry, guys. No, no stress. I could I could do that front if you wanted to. There you go. While folks are thinking about responses, the document that I just um, sent the link to is the is the information interview that I was referring to earlier. If you plan to modify it, I would just please just give credit to Delmi <laughs> on that. I would say regarding student development needs, I think just the importance of assessment. Um, we're you know trying to put out pretty frequent assessments to kind of gauge where our students are at, what they're looking for, what they're interested in, and like maybe where they're developmentally, you know, need some programming or some ways to develop in those different areas. So I know we're putting together our big kind of end of the year uh, resident satisfaction survey, which will touch a lot on our facilities, our programming, basically how did we do over the course of the year and, and what did you get out of it? Um, and then also we do have a couple questions on there leading into like if you're a returning student, what are some things that you're hoping to see in housing next year? How can we better you know, challenge and develop you as a student moving ahead uh, thinking of next year? So over the summer, we'll review that data to try to think about some different programmatic things uh, that we wanna try and maybe uh, tweak some of our living learning communities, things of that nature too. So I think the value of assessments are very important in, in student development and keeping us relevant. I can share that we've also been working within our division to um, redevelop our, our learning goals and learning outcomes. So that's been really helpful. So we'll be spending a lot of time over the summer looking at our curriculum and adapting it to reflect our new learning goals. We're kind of doing something similar to that. Um, so for the longest time, our assessment has been done where we have to fill it out similar to like the faculty, even though we're not faculty and our goals and our mission and our vision don't line up the same as like a syllabus. Um, I mean, our goals and mission come from 
our college goals emission, like we wrote it off that and our residential curriculum is based on our goals emission, but um, there's been rework to get us more on the student affairs assessment aspect and doing a different form of assessment um, that explains like why we do our programming the way we do, why we have the community building we have, stuff like that versus like someone attending my class and getting an answer A's. Like it just didn't, I would always fill it out and be like, how do I even answer this? Like, okay. So I was the person with lots of notes in mind when I would submit it because I couldn't answer the way they wanted. So it was very entertaining. Um, the other thing is we're starting to use our technology more. Um, so we have different technologies where we can send out micro surveys. I don't know if you've ever seen those. Um, but you can shoot them out to a building, to a floor, to a campus community of some aspect and ask them one to three questions and get automatic feedback. Um, we use it for everything from like, is your hot water hot enough during the winter months? To is your heat regulated properly to make you feel comfortable? To are you staying for spring break? Um, so we kind of get a really quick feed on all different things or we do want always at the beginning of the semester, like what kind of programming would you prefer in the fall? So, but there are three questions with three to four answers. So really quick feedback. Um, and it has helped change and update stuff. And we've also noticed like what we should do for programming different than what we used to do. And yes, food is still the number one thing to get students to programs, or at least at our school. Um, is there anybody else that wants to talk on this area? We put a couple of things just in the chat. Um, part of my collective set of responsibilities are in residential life overall, and then I have all of the kind of health related offices report to me as well. And one of the things that they do collectively is to send out an email, um, a, a letter to all incoming first year students. It's a much longer than this, but there's these critical questions here that we ask and encourage um, students to really engage with their own families. Uh, before they even get to campus um, around their own health and well-being um, and particular strategies that they would use, you know, in support of that, um, to be thinking about those things ahead of time and to be thinking about the su support systems in place. They don't have to give up the responses to these questions, but I think anything that we could do before our students even get to us to encourage a particular kind of dialogue, both for students um, who haven't been in care before, but particularly for students and we know more and more of them today are already in care, right? Either for medical purposes and, and or for mental health purposes. Um, it's, it's essential that they have those conversations. Vassar is a, a kind of school that draws globally and nationally, right? So it's not like a set of students that can just go home if something um, is going, you know, wrong. Um, it's that they got to work through that and, and figure out that particular capacity to do so. And so, like I said, these conversations have been helpful. One of the things that has happened is that they've connected much earlier to our resources. So even before coming to campus, even before having an issue or a problem, they're already connecting with case management, they're connecting with health service, they're connecting with counseling, trying to set up some meetings. They're connecting with folks to say, hey, what do, what do you know about our off-campus resources and therapists and those kinds of things? Um, I don't wanna talk at all up to this letter that we send, but we've seen a significant increase in that kind of like um, upfront work um, to to kind of get themselves you know prepared to be here. End of the year, guys. You know how it all is, right? Multitasking. I like what you do, Dean. I mean, Dean. I'm talking to three different people. Louise, I like what you do with the email. Do you send that to everybody in your department to go out or just to specific areas? Like, I never know everybody who oversees what. Like, who does the email go to again? I'm sorry. So this, the areas that I oversee are, are Res Life and um, the health and wellness side of things. So this is a collective letter that goes out to all first year students. Um, there's a version of, of this that goes out by, by the house advisors, our versions of RDs to their re specific residents to like fill out a form to tell us a little bit more about yourself and, and strategies. And that's a little bit more personal. That's another form. I'll have to see if I can find that one. Would you be okay if I took the questions that you put into the chat and send them out to the group that's here today? Okay, perfect. Um, 
And then the last question that I have on file, and then of course we can talk about anything anybody wants to talk about, is what are some department staff structural adjustments that have worked best for small residence life offices? And I will put it in the chat also. Did you finish it? Hold on. I would maybe even like expand that because I know I've heard some conversations from some other groups where um, even if it doesn't necessarily mean readjusting the uh, org of the department, rethinking job descriptions and uh, job requirements, I know that and making sure that um, the positions that you're advertising are what the people are actually going to be expected to do. Do you think everybody it would help me? Because there's, you know, a large group of us to put what in the chat box, like how many students beds we have and what the structure for full time staff is. And then whether you like it or not, like a thumbs up or thumbs down to your own setup. We can do that and I will copy and paste it. I already started an email for today's chat. So I will just put it all in there for you, Amy, so you don't have to copy it all down. Does that work? Um, right now we're rewriting our RD position to area coordinator. So all the RDs are going to switch to area coordinator because within our structure, in our union, all of that, we're a state college. Um, I cannot have, if we lose an RD, I cannot have an RD oversee another residence hall the way that the job position is written. But I can have them, if it's written as an area coordinator, oversee a second hall. So we are changing our title so that we can do that because right now I'm the director and I oversee two halls because we're down in RD and my assistant directors seeing two halls because we're down two RDs and instead if we had area coordinators I would probably still have one hall but we could give one of the area coordinators a second hall versus them having a one hall so that is one thing that we're changing um, also it makes it so we can push to have people with experience or people that are in a master's degree more um, or have completed versus right now you can be a bachelor's degree with no experience. So those are some things that we're working on to try to help our area. And I am copying and pasting all of this lovely knowledge into the email that I'm missing you. And anybody else can talk. I would say for our structure, which I put in the chat, um, I'm new to my institution this year. Actually, my whole staff, we all kind of came on at the same time. So we started fresh all together. Um, but prior to this staff, and I guess prior to COVID, there were um, previously like two uh, resident directors or like area coordinators or professional staff that were hired by the college. Uh, when COVID happened, those were, those were kind of pushed to the wayside. And then this is our first year with a graduate area coordinator and that role has worked out very well. Um, they picked basically a student that was an undergrad coming back for their master's this year to fill the role. Uh, for next year, we're kind of doing the same. And I think next year when we do the hiring, we're gonna try to open it up to other higher ed programs in the area, but that has been a very successful program. Um, having that role kind of swapped out for what used to be professional staff to now kind of semi-professional um, but still giving that student uh, the opportunity to get their feet wet in higher ed um, and also work with part of their master's program here at the college. So that has worked uh, pretty well. And for our staffing needs right now, um, our occupancy is down. So right now the, the system works, but who knows if we ever get back to full capacity, maybe we might be a little more stressed and we might reevaluate that, but for the moment it's working. One of our, that's just a wonky uh, place, but we have um, six house advisors, campus of about 2,500 students. Our, again, house advisors are, are, are the equivalents. And we have nine traditional houses and then three apartment areas. Um, 
what we've done with the three position with six with th three of the six positions is um we we reduce like their responsibility of one house um and then give them an assistant director title to a specific area so one is like an assistant director for conduct another is assistant director for housing and then the third is an assistant director for residential education and while it doesn't mean more pay it just means a um one less kind of you know um responsibility for a house but more responsibility for greater a greater role in the office um and that has helped with retention i think um, to, our folks typically stay at least four years their max is at five um here um and we see most of our folks chiefly because we pay well we're, we're at the higher end of the whatever the flsa or fsla whatever the acronym is we're at the higher end so i know we pay well but i also think the kind of assistant director positions have also helped them with you know aspiring to something from within the office it's there's not much more room to go after that uh, other than out but at least internally there's a sense that there's something to achieve after you know a couple of years I have been collecting all the data you guys have said. I have taken away like your names and the time that you did it because I kind of went and posted. Um, so the email is going to say like register for a symposium and it's going to have the link. And then it's going to say resources from questions and it has everything from the Google Doc that Louise shared to the questions. And then I separated it out to what are some structural, I put the question and then I put all your guys' colleges. So with your information that you've shared in the chat. So thank you guys for doing that. And I will hit send to this bad boy as soon as we are done today. So that way everybody has the information. Does that work? And of course, if anything else gets out between now and the end of our chat, I will definitely add it into the email, I promise. So does anybody else want to talk about structural changes or is there other questions out there that people would like to talk about, work on? I mean, we've done about 29 minutes today. I don't want to use up time if we don't have anything to really discuss. I feel like we've done a ton in 29 minutes, to be honest. But if there is a question or if there's something we can support you with or a conversation, let me know. Oh, Deb's got her hand up. I have two things. One is just a quick, um, I've heard from people that are visiting campus that not a lot of schools are doing residence hall tours. And I'm wondering like thumbs up, thumbs down, if you're still doing residence hall tours and showing rooms. Okay. Yeah, we had a hard time getting rooms. So we had a student move out in December and we took his room and made it a tour room. And um, we're actually paying students in our suite style to, um, to be to our hosts, like just to show their rooms. So that's something new that we're doing that I don't really want to do next year because it's a little harder to get them on payroll and all that. And then I had another quick question, if you don't mind me jumping for two. So we have, um, we're small, um, 450 beds, and we have three undergraduate RDs right now. And I was approved to get a full time RD for next year. So I'm, doing the paperwork to get it advertised. I know I'm a little bit late for that, but um, what are some creative ways that you have um, recruited for um, RD positions? Post the salary. Post oh yeah, the yeah, salary, yeah. Right up front, that is the biggest thing I've seen on Facebook pages lately is people are applying for jobs they don't know the salaries. And that has made it so we post a salary. And as soon as we do that, we know that people that apply actually know everything. Um, also use social media. Some people are really creative. There's a school right now on Sam's and Women in Higher Ed Facebook page. And I think even the Residence Life one, they're doing a dance and it's like four of them in the staff and they're talking about coming. I'm not doing any of that. Um, you guys are lucky you get to see my face on video. Um, I don't do any of the pictures and videos, but some people are getting like super creative 
And I like was scrolling through the other day on like SAMs and housing pages for job postings just to see what people are doing. And I was like, I want to apply to that college just because they're dancing and making it look like it's a wonderful place to go to. Um, not that I'm leaving here, but you know what I mean? Like that really caught my eye. So maybe scroll through those and see what catches your eye and then use those things for your own recruitment purposes. But are the undergraduate students on those sites? No, but there's RA sites out there. And then also use your alumni office. So we also let our alumni office know when we're posting a position and they will send it out to their alumni listserv. And that actually has gotten us some good people that were RAs like five, six years ago that went and got their master's or went and did work experience and now want to come back. Mm -hmm. Okay. Debbie, um, uh, maybe I missed this part, but is, is this position a, a undergraduate position? No, they need to have their bachelor's and they can get their master's at any of the Idaho colleges. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have a master's program at our school, but you can get one at any of the other three um, just for being a full time employee. So um, I was thinking so we have um, two big universities 30 minutes north north of us, and I was going to reach out to their directors of residence life as well, just to see if they have any undergrads who are looking to get their master's and kind of stay in the field. I know. Are okay. you specifically looking for people that are student affairs oriented or are you open to folks who um, come from different backgrounds, whether it's, you know, they might want to get an MBA or maybe they were a political science major? Um, mm -hmm. Or is it like we strictly want a student affairs, a person who's looking to be a student affairs professional? Um, yeah. and we're, OK, yeah. I mean, I, I don't I don't even have degrees in student affairs. I'm a psychology MBA person, so yeah. I'm open to. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, the reason why I said that is I would make I would definitely suggest like what Elizabeth said, definitely posting on social media. Um, that is where you'll attract a lot of diverse people that also aren't from your institution and will come with a bunch of different set of values and resources and knowledge. Um, that might be great. The other thing I would mention is, and I know this is an obvious, but I I think it's important, and I think one of the things I've noticed in just recruiting is even if the salary, like what um, um, Beth said before, even if the salary is really low and it's something that you know folks might not want, I think posting it is important, but also being fully transparent about what the role is. Mm -hmm. I think um, knowing what you're going to get yourself into, okay, it's a $35,000 a year job, free housing, a meal plan, um, but you know, it's um, only 40 hours a week. We're pretty strict about, you know, making sure we end up at the clock or it's really busy. I, I think, you know, n mentioning those things is really important. And even if it is like a little bit more heavy loaded with, with um, you know, with, with a lot of work or, or a lot of time commitments, um, there are folks who will be open to that, especially young, maybe younger folks who want the experience for a year or two. Um, but I think just being fully transparent of what the role is has been really successful for a lot of people, even people that don't have huge budgets. Um, people are, are a lot more excited and more interested in a position when they know fully what they're getting into. I always, you know, I know me, I always question like when there's not enough information and they're not posting the salary and they're not telling me the full story of what I'm going to get into. And there's like five bullets about what the job entails. I'm like, is that it? And it makes me wonder. So just being fully transparent and having, you know, a, a full idea of what we're going to get into, I think would be definitely helpful for you and for recruiting purposes. Thank you. Yeah, I got it to 40,000, which I think is decent. It's not great, but it's decent and it's 11 month. So That's I'm hoping that will help. Higher than some right now. So, I mean, I don't see that being not decent. Yeah. And to piggyback off of what Stephen was saying and not to give too many spoilers for uh, next week's symposium, registration is still open, um, but one of the uh, conversations I've heard around that was that idea of in the job description, you know, one of the things that small campuses like to tout is that if you work here, you get a chance to do a wide variety of things, you wear yeah. many hats, you, you get a broad experience that can help set you up for the future. And, but to be honest about that in regards to, um, about what the position is going to entail and that you will get that experience and position it in a way that it is, we're going to help you develop this broad range of skills and not just use it as an excuse to say, we're going to make you do a whole bunch of extra work. Okay. The other thing is LinkedIn, it's free. And then have your colleagues from your institution share it or 
we have a great opportunity, come work with us. The thing you have to, we have to be careful of, maybe not other schools, is if we put like contact me, we have to let HR know if you're the hiring manager who's contacted you. And we have to always say we referred them to HR um, or to the posting. Mm -hmm. uh, but definitely use LinkedIn. Like my boss, literally the vice president will share in her LinkedIn, like come work with me. It's a great place. And we have this position and that's free. And everybody's in LinkedIn that's looking for a job most of the time in higher ed. So, um, but also I didn't realize the alumni office would be so helpful. And we actually have gotten almost every year, some good candidates out of our alumni pool. And they're not res lifers, like two were never even RAs. Um, but their work experience has really added to their position here. Great. That, I never would have thought of that. So that's great. Thank you, everybody. I'm yeah. trying to find free ways to advertise. Yeah. <laughs> I think that maybe related to some of the stuff I already heard, I, I you know, offer, I think this is for, for all of us, particularly at small schools is like, you know, I lean heavy, heavily on the quirkiness of the institution. Like that is, that is a selling point for me, you know, for me. So, and I, and I try to figure out, particularly in the recruitment pro process, how might I signal to this individual that we're a different kind of place? Uh, so like, you know, whenever I would go to uh, one of those national kind of like, you know, conferences for recruitment, you know, I never sat on the, on the opposite side of the table. I, I would sit on the same side of the table. So like, this is how we function. This is the kind of proximity we have to people. I need to signal this to you early. Um, we would offer what we would call uh, reverse interviews during the interview process, which are essentially informational interviews. And that that part of this, like, hey, we are we are partners in trying to sort through whether we can work together, not just us choosing you, but you choosing us. Mm -hmm. we want to give you as much info, and all of that, like, you know, I was at a place, I loved it. I was at NYU before, right? Big place, sold itself, you know, in the city. Um, it's a it's a it's a it's a monster it's big right and and there, those kinds of things that being that personal wasn't what would you know drove it but when I got to Vassar I was like oh my god this is a a unique kind of place and I really need to signal early to people like that it is it is different and what are the ways that I could start to do that during the recruitment process and so things like this started to develop for me like the same side of the table and the reverse interviews or all those kinds of things and um, and every time I do that reverse interview with a candidate, they will they they will say, "This is the first time I've had this happen," and I'm like, "Oh, this is the this is the kind of thing that happens at a small school, mm -hmm. where you could be a bit more imaginative about the work and the way that you do that that work." So, so is it legitimate to put like low discipline, high student contact? Yeah, yeah. If that is that's the nature. This is that transparency that Stephen was talking about. If that's the yeah. nature of the work. I'd be clear. Yeah, like, look, we, you know, like our folks here, um, what other folks might say is handholding, like, they're, they're, we are high touch. Yeah. We are high touch. There's not an issue a student is experiencing from failing a class to suicide acuity that we are not, you know, typically not aware of. Like, we are going to be there and we're going to want to be there. And we want people who want to be there. Yeah, I would. I think people might lean into that, especially these. The, the conduct stuff if it's lower <laughs> yeah, we don't have a lot of parties there's not a ton of alcohol mm. um, it really is just relational so it's getting to know students and helping them through their two or four years so this is great thank you everybody i wish we could say we we're not conduct heavy we are we just say you to wear lots of hats and i always am very transparent of oh, here's your percentage breakdown and we really try to stick to that the other thing is if you are a work-life balance place like that will help if you talk about that when they're interviewing with you like explaining that like when they're off you do not expect phone calls you do not expect emails you don't expect test messages it's only emergency purposes and i think we've had to do it like twice my whole time here in seven years where we've had to call everybody in but that's because we have like a big on-campus emergency it's not because of anything else um and we try to acknowledge people's work-life balance I always joke with my RDs, like if I send you an email at 10 o'clock at night, I'm not expecting you to respond to it. It's just getting it out of my inbox so that I can get caught up. Um, please respond to it your next business day in. So, and also sticking to that. I've had bosses tell me that and then they don't stick to that. So stick to what you say, like don't just do it. But transparency is very important. 
Um, is there anything else anybody wants to talk about? Yeah, I just had a quick question for everyone. Um, so at Goldie Beacom, we've recently had a few outliers of um, incoming students that want to live on campus that are quite older. Um, I was curious if any of your colleges had an age policy or some sort of any kind of, you all are shaking your heads now, but any kind of. We can't have an age policy. Yeah, it's a, it's a law, right. it's, a, it's illegal. Right, yeah. right. I know, have, I know that. I was just curious. How how are you guys dealing with that? Um, we have two smaller houses, like um, okay. nine, 10 people who that's where we put our older students, but we have a conversation with them when they apply for housing. Cause sometimes they don't know that they exist. And, um, we say, okay, so, cause I have a woman, my age, I'm 56. I, we have a woman, my age, who's living in the hall. She's married. Her husband lives separately. She's just here for, to finish up her degree. And then she's done. And, um, we, we have a conversation with them. Okay, think about when you were 18, moving out of your family's house for the first time, the noise level, the hours that you kept, like we're very honest with them about what it's like to live in a traditional residence hall or even the suite style halls. We have three women in their thirties in our nursing program who are living in one of our residence halls. And when they did room selection, they wanted to stay in the same building and they've complained all year about the people above them. Right. And the people above them are like, we don't, we're not parties, we're nursing students too. We we just study. And so um, we shifted these women with their permission to our building with older people. They have full size beds. They're fully furnished. They don't have to have a meal plan. They have a full kitchen. So we've just kind of like, and we toured them of that in that building or that house to say like, here, this is what your options are. And they were like, holy cow, we didn't know this existed. We're so happy you told us about this. And they're going to be way more successful in that. But I know that not all schools have, we have like 13 houses that we rent out as well as six small residence halls. Our biggest hall is 115 people. Okay. So it's just kind of nice that we have like the other nooks and crannies to put people into when um, they don't fit into a hall. Yeah. We, and yeah, we do the know. same thing here as yeah. well. I was just going to say, we do the same thing that Debbie mentioned. Um, we have that conversation, but I think, um, you know, one of the things that we've already started looking at, because I know this might have been a conversation we had previously in this group last or a couple of weeks ago, but um, in general, enrollment numbers everywhere are kind of down and housing numbers everywhere are significantly down. So we've already started looking at areas of the campus where we can convert things to family, kind of go back to that old school um, uh, family housing kind of an option. So if there is somebody who comes in with, um, you know, a partner and kids, we can put them in this, um, you know, apartment that has a full kitchen and has two bedrooms and can accommodate that sort of thing. So we've kind of already looked at those spaces and that's usually where, our old, you know, quote unquote, I hate using the term older students, but older students we place too. But um, yeah, it's such a tough conversation, but we always make sure, and one of the things we do is we run everything by our legal too, just to make sure that we are not setting ourselves up for, you know, even with any uh, terminology or anything, um, for a potential lawsuit, because that, that with things like this, it can it can get sticky really quick. Yeah, definitely. We also um, we have a conversation. We have a lot of students that are all across ages. Like right now, we have a woman that's I don't know. We have fifties, forties, thirties, late twenties on campus. Always have. Um, a lot of times they come for one semester and then they look for housing in the area for the second semester. Um, or like we have a man and he's hilarious. He comes and has coffee with me like once a month. Um, he's been here for two years now. He graduates this year. Can't watch, wait to watch him graduate. I think of him like a dad. He's not old enough to be my dad, but he's a little bit older than me. And I think of him like a dad. Um, but anyways, he walks in, we have coffee. Um, when he applied, he said, I'm only doing this because I live in the city and I can't commute every day. Um, I just need somewhere to lay my head where would you recommend I laid my head as like an apartment off campus? Because I, I didn't know if he was being sincere or funny and I am snarky. So I didn't think he doesn't know I kind of meet on campus. So I was like, okay, no problem. So we have a couple of different options and I always run through them with them. Our main place that a lot of our students that are non-traditional age live is we have an upperclassman hall. It's not 24 hour quiet hours. 
um, but it's upperclassmen hall where you walk in, you can have a single, and then when you use the bathroom, it is in the hallway, but you shut and lock the door and you have the shower, the sink, and the toilet to yourself. They appreciate that. Those are not on our common tours. So we make sure to always take them there. They come a lot in the summer. They're always like more planned than our 18 and 19 year olds. Like mm -hmm. they've got questions. They want answers. They're more detailed. It's lovely. I love working with them. Um, some people don't. I do. I don't know why. Um, but I walk them through and I show them options. And I'm like, if you want to live in our traditional upperclassmen hall, I'm not putting you in a freshman hall because you won't be happy. They won't be happy. They're going to call you mom. You're going to get frustrated. It's not going to work. So I at least will put, I will show them a double in a non-traditional freshman hall. They never pick that. They will pick singles. They will pick our apartments for our upperclassmen. And right now we have three nurses that are in a suite in an apartment, which is four, but we let them go as three. And they each have their own bedroom and they have an apartment and their age is 30 to 40 and they're loving it um, because it works out. So it's just having those conversations. Um, it helps a lot with respect too. Like they feel like they're heard because mm -hmm. a lot of times they're trying to come back and do a major either later in life because they're trying to change their career or they're trying to get their education now because their children have grown up. Um, but just let them be heard and show them what you have. And if you don't have something right now, create that area. Like we don't have marriage, ho marriage housing or children housing, but we can show areas that we have for non-traditional age students. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have it, I would just talk to someone to see if you can create that environment. I wish we had houses like a couple of these people do because that would make my life a lot easier. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we accommodate and we also talk to them about living off campus because a lot of times they will say when I'm talking to them, I just want to come up for a semester to get my feet wet and to know the area. Mm -hmm. And then I get them in touch with like actual realtors and stuff like that instead of just sending them to like the typical college housing. Mm -hmm. And they normally end up finding a really nice place and sure. or they stay on campus, either one. We don't care. Yeah. But thanks everybody. No problem. Anything else? So we will see most of you next week. Well, you guys will all be getting an email from me shortly after this. We hope to see everybody next week. Jess, you've got all of our thoughts and prayers and we will help you as much as we can. Um, and it is going to be a wonderful thing. And it, three months from now, you're probably gonna come on this and be like, look at me, I got this great job, everything's good, it's perfect. And we'll be like, yes, it worked. Just make yeah, sure you um, end up at another small school, Jess, so you can keep coming to this phone call. That, that, that is my goal. Come anyways. <laughs> <laughs> um, but if you guys need anything, I am just putting it as two with all your guys' email addresses so you guys can all email each other if there's something, anything outside of this that you want to contact about. Um, feel free. I didn't think it mattered. I didn't think I need to BCC you all. Um, but it's only the people that were part of this today. So... If you have anything else, let us know and have an amazing spring. We'll see you guys next week or next month. Take care, everybody. Thank you so much Thank for your time. You. Bye, everyone. Bye, Bye Jane. Bye, Bess. Bye. Bye.